Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Um, uh, thank you all for coming today. I know it's raining outside. Um, and um, even though, you know, um, it's raining, you you came here. So I, I think it's really uh, great because uh, we really miss um, in-person meetings and lectures. And I think slowly we are, you know, coming back to this more uh, direct uh, communication mode. I uh, would like to thank, um, first of all, of course, uh, Roger uh, Grabowski, who, uh, you know, was uh, from the beginning involved in, in, the, in the process and, and had this idea of, you know, opening a, or, or holding a, a lecture on urbanism and Tokyo's urbanism. Of course, also uh, Lakeland University for, uh, you know, calling me, but also for uh, uh, having these lectures because I have been seeing the historical record of the lectures that you have uh, conducted until now. And uh, it's very interesting that you are um, opening a, or, or addressing very relevant issues in Japan. And uh, well, me as a foreigner also in Japan, I, I think we miss this kind of events. We miss uh, discussion, opportunities for discussions in English, um, even for some topics, even in Japanese. And I think it's really great that you are doing this. Uh, yeah, this activity. So I'm going to take, sorry, I'm going to take my, my mask. I feel like a little bit naked now because you know, in, in Japan, you always have to wear masks. Um, uh, but anyway, so uh, first of all, I would like to, well, uh, Roger already uh, mentioned uh, the book and I'm going to uh, also introduce a little bit my background. Um, well, I'm an architect, I am, a, um, I'm a, a associate professor, sorry, I think this should work like this. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Keio University and also a, a practicing architect in, in Tokyo. And uh, well, uh, um, uh, well, the book, the, this is the book covers that um, uh, uh, we just published. Uh, uh, on the left, you can see uh, the English version and on the right, uh, the Japanese version that appeared just this weekend. And uh, well, for those of you who prefer to read in, in, in Japanese, well, now there is a Japanese version. Basically, the contents are same, but of course, language needs required a lot of adjustments. Um, so first of all, I would like to, you know, let you, I mean, I mean, share with you a little bit what I'm doing as an architect. Um, basically, uh, we, with my office and also with my students, uh, we have been involved in, in renovations in the countryside, you know, like there is a lot of Akiya, like empty houses, and we have been involved in this kind of work. But also I have been working in, in Tokyo, like in very central areas, like commercial uh, projects. Um, but also we have been working on public spaces or try to, uh, trying to uh, do like some interventions in public spaces. And I think these experiences were also very important to understand later uh, uh, the kind of research that we started and that uh, kind of culminated or finished in the publication of this book. Uh, we did, uh, we have been doing several projects, but uh, one of the things that uh, we kind of understood through these projects is that um, once you start doing actual things in Japan, uh, many of the, let's say, stereotypes and many of the ideas or even prejudices or, I don't know, dominant narratives that we tend to think about Japanese culture, Japanese cities, um, Tokyo even, kind of disappear, right? Um, there are like many things that are repeated in the literature about Tokyo, uh, about Tokyo, about Japanese urbanism, which are kind of, I would say, even like cliches. And once you really try to do something, then you understand that uh, uh, they are like just, uh, you know, like uh, almost like uh, uh, tropes that are repeated over the decades without anyone uh, taking care of actually checking them out. And just to give you an example, um, you know, I know that my audience today is, is very diverse and not only architects or urbanists, but uh, for example, uh, there are a lot of discussions about public space in Japan. So lots of people, for example, say that there is no concept of public space in Japan because in, in the Edo period, there was no word or there, is, there was no word for public in Japanese language. And that sometimes we need to say in katakana, Fabriku, etc. Other people say that, um, in fact, you know, um, 
the Japanese, they don't need a, a concept of public space because in a almost um, natural way, they have a special capacity that Westerners don't have to create public space uh, whenever they want. And through their activities, they create, there are like many things. And at the end, all these things, uh, they kind of justify or try to explain why in fact, there are like so few public spaces in Tokyo. Yeah, there are few, uh, I mean, we will look at uh, old uh, Edo uh, prints and ukiyo-e, we can see lots of public spaces, but now in contemporary Tokyo, not. And uh, well, the reason is basically because, you know, basically because if you try to do something quite simple, like putting some chairs, this was a project in, we wanted to activate a plaza here in Yokohama, you, maybe some of you can recognize. And it was a project in order to kind of test how uh, urban furniture could activate public space. It was very difficult because basically, um, um, you, you know, the regulations are so strict that something quite simple, like putting a, a, a very innocent chair, in this case, were a recycled chair from 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 the school, from uh, primary schools, um, uh, was basically considered like a super dangerous activity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we. Uh, at the end, we gave up, and uh, because we have to receive uh, permission from the police, etc., it was super complicated. We gave up, and what uh, we did our um, project in this plaza, which is looks like a public space, but in, in fact is a privately owned uh, open space. And therefore, we 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 got the, the permission from the owner of this space, and we managed to do it. And there was nothing. Dangerous. I mean, people were enjoying. People, children were playing with the chairs. People were moving them. It was like a, a little bit like a social experiment to see like how actual Japanese would react to these kind of spaces. And there was no problem at all. I mean, the only problem was really regulation. There was no cultural issue. No one was throwing away um, or throwing to each other chairs like some of the people we consulted told that some drunken people would come and, and not, nothing, no problem. So what was the, the actual problem was legislation, the regulation. Sometimes, let's say regulations, um, explicit regulations, but very often implicit. So you don't really, it's not written anywhere, but once you start to do something, you see the, the barriers there. So from this kind of uh, uh, experiences, uh, we kind of realized that we needed to take a more pragmatic viewpoint on Tokyo and try to you know, set aside a little bit all those dominant narratives and, and try to look uh, at Tokyo through more, a more material viewpoint, like legislation, history, social issues, et cetera, rather than this kind of culturalist or essentialist approach that dominates most of the narrative most of the uh, uh, literature, I would say. So uh, that's, that's our uh, approach. Uh, basically, we want to demystify all these kind of dominant narratives that surround Tokyo, but I would say even like Japanese culture in general, it's especially in the literature in English, and, and see really in a pragmatic way, how does Tokyo work? I mean, this is the title of this lecture, no? like how and because most of us would um, agree that actually it works quite well, uh, considering that it's a, a huge city, it's a, ma a mega city. Um, if we consider all the prefectures surrounding uh, Tokyo, the central uh, 23 wards, uh, we could say that one third of Japan lives around here, right? So it's, it's a mega city, but still uh, there are like very close communities, uh, you can uh, go to uh, very nice restaurants and, and, and spend, uh, you meet, meet people on the streets. Um, there is a kind of intimacy here that I, I think most of uh, you uh, I probably will, will uh, agree with me that uh, somehow Tokyo managed to uh, balance this kind of mega growth with a, a certain uh, feeling of being also in many places a kind of village right? where you can still have that kind of human contact uh, well, uh, maybe we should start differentiating here, like, or start to say that there are many Tokyos, right? So there are not, not only one single Tokyo, and there are many types of Tokyo, but in order to uh, simplify things, I think we could say that there are like basically two types of Tokyo. And I think this photograph probably taken from the Tokyo uh, uh, sky tree. We are, by the way, 
here is Ryo Goku, right? We are around here, right? Yeah. And now it's not uh, for those who are maybe for those who are uh, not in, in Japan now, now the sky is not like this. It's, we are at night uh, and it's raining. Um, but uh, yeah, we are here. This is Sumida River. Uh, we can see here like Tokyo Bay and the, the, the Imperial Palace here and also the Mount Fuji here in the back. Um, so uh, basically what we see, and this is probably true for most of Tokyo, is that Tokyo is almost like a pixelated city in which uh, the, the urban texture is very granular, very small scale, but also we have kind of clusters of uh, super high rises this one, for example, is basically the Marunouchi area in front of the Imperial Palace. Also around the Tokyo Bay, uh, many of these high rises are appearing. So uh, there is a kind of lack of an in-between situation. An in-between situation, I would say, is, would be maybe the model of European cities. Where we have like an average of seven, eight. Um, I'm thinking about Paris. I'm thinking about Berlin or thinking about Barcelona, for example in which the medium rise uh, typologies are dominant. Here we have a kind of uh, maybe uh, uh, two extremes, like the super mega rise or uh, the uh, relatively low rise and uh, not so much in between. Uh, well, we can see, for example, along major streets that the, um, um, the, the scale goes up a little bit. And I will talk about that. Um, so, I would like to talk first uh, about this kind of Tokyo, the kind of Tokyo of this uh, of the mega scale, and uh, why I consider that uh, that kind of Tokyo is probably the kind of Tokyo that, from my viewpoint, is working uh, maybe in a less uh, powerful or a, a less interesting uh, way. So this kind of Tokyo that uh, until now was quite restricted to just Marunouchi area or uh, West Shinjuku. Now we can see it everywhere. Um, but, you know, um, for some of us who have been here like almost a couple of decades, um, we were, we are, uh, many of us like quite surprised like how rapidly uh, Tokyo changed in the last 20 years. Uh, the process started around the mid eighties through several deregulation processes that allowed uh, these mega towers to uh, appear. Um, and later in the 90s, uh, other projects like the Bisu Garden Place. In 2003, uh, we have this super uh, famous project of uh, Rapongi Hills, but immediately after uh, Tokyo Midtown, Toranamon, Toranamon Hills, we have many of these projects and they are very, very similar. They are basically uh, super high rise towers with a podium or kind of low rise uh, part. Uh, that is basically, most, in most cases, uh, a kind of shopping mall-like uh, space. And we, if we map those new redevelopments, we are seeing that they are spreading around and not being only like um, uh, constrained to, to few areas like in the past. We even see them in, in quite, uh, let's say, suburban areas. All of a sudden, you can see a landscape of, uh, uh, of tiny houses and all of a sudden a huge tower in the middle, right? This, this kind of landscape is actually happening. In, in current Tokyo. So why is this happening? Uh, there is a logic behind, uh, and there is a, a political intention and a vision, uh, which is not new at all, in fact. Uh, the reason why is because um, several instances of, of uh, well, the, uh, uh, policymakers and also developers basically consider that Tokyo is not efficient. Uh, this kind of structure, right? The low rise structure is not safe, is not efficient, is problematic. And therefore the proposal is to uh, take the same amount of population and bring them into one single tower so that they uh, you know, create open space. This is in fact a one, one diagram from, that I took from uh, a Mori building uh, website. So this is the vision. So you, instead of having this kind of a very close, neat, kind of granular urban fabric, why not to just put one single tower and then you can have a park? What do you think? Does it sound good for you? Does it sound 
attractive. I don't know, maybe there are several opinions about that, right? My point is that this is not idea, an, a new idea at all because Le Corbusier, maybe some of you know this, probably the most famous modern architect, you know, like all, um, even until recently, all architects in the world admired Le Corbusier and were always even following his, his fashion style using like, um, um, uh, round a glass, round a glasses, you know, with a, a black frame. Like so, everyone was admiring uh, uh, Le Corbusier, and he's great as an architect. But I'm not sure if he's, he's great as a, as an urbanist or as an urban planner, because he proposed this plan Voisin in uh, 1925, which was I don't know if you recognize this, but uh, well, this is Notre Dame, this is Paris. Uh, he proposed to erase most of the central areas, historical areas of Paris. I think he respected the Louvre, yeah, here. Uh, but basically he said that, well, you know, Paris was not working well, was not efficient, was a mess, was problematic, was not safe. So let's, you know, demolish Paris and put all these towers in a, in a grid so that exactly now as developers are saying now, we can have like open spaces and greenery and so on. But the French say, no, 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 we want to keep Paris, right? And that's why we can enjoy Paris now. What is happening in Tokyo? Well, um, this is an example of uh, Roppongi Hills. This was uh, the site of Roppongi Hills before uh, the construction started. And basically the project consisted of very, uh, it took, I think, 15 years to buy a piece by piece every site, every plot. And at the end, they managed to, you know, buy all this land, and they created uh, this, which is again, um, you know, this this uh, project of of a huge uh, office tower with uh, residential towers, and well, there is a hotel here, but basically connected with a kind of shopping mall like landscape. So uh, this is not a kind of spontaneous, uh, kind of unintended result of, let's say some kind of uncontrolled capitalist forces. It's, there is a vision behind and, and Moribiru, I think Mori building, uh, it's quite uh, as a representative and, and maybe the most important uh, uh, developer is quite open about uh, what they want. They say they want to create, a they want to change Tokyo and they want to change Tokyo into a vertical green city. So it's, there is an intention and they're very open. You can go to the website, there is no hiding. I mean, it's, it's quite open. Um, for all of you who have been living in, in, in Tokyo uh, for a long time, maybe you remember this drawing. When you go out, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, when you go to Roppongi Hills, the first thing it was like a huge drawing uh, explaining the vision of the company. And they say, well, hope in the sky, green on the ground, and joy beneath the surface. So this is the concept, right? Like you, uh, you have like uh, skyscrapers, they kind of, try to make the surface green, and then you have a, a, an underground space. But I don't know if there is so much joy beneath the surface because at the end, uh, if you go there, it's really like a shopping mall, right? Maybe some of you love shopping malls, but I think cities should have more than shopping malls and, and, and we should not, you know, like uh, have, keep the diversity of Tokyo is maybe one interesting goal. And if you go to the surface, in fact, is, there is a, a, some park, yeah, but most of the surface is not green at all. And the surface is also, again, like a shopping mall. So I'm not sure. I mean, this is a drawing that looks very nice and very lively. But at the end, when you go there and you see the, the reality, I think uh, uh, it's quite different. So um, yeah, but why are developers doing th this? What, what is the mechanism? What is the legislation behind that? Well, there is something called uh, well, we can call it in different ways. Uh, in the United States, they call it uh, the uh, uh, Plaza Bonas. Uh, it's, it started in New York in the 60s, I believe, uh, but maybe the system was starting to be tested in the, in the early 50s. And uh, with the Seagram building, maybe in New York, you know, the Seagram building by Miss van der Rohe was the first uh, project that uh, used this system. Uh, the system consists of uh, incentivizing developers to change uh, 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 sites and plots by, um, by uh, offering them more uh, floor area ratio. So the, this is the deal. Um, the city is controlled by regulation. You cannot 
build whatever you want. And basically one important thing is sunlight regulation. So you basically uh, need to respect, allow people to get some sunlight on the streets and also on, on other buildings. Uh, but uh, this new regulation, it's regulated through different uh, uh, frameworks, but I'm not going to give the details here, uh, allows uh, developers to get more floor area, ratio, floor area ratio, more space, more, more surface, more floor, uh, if they provide what they call a privately owned public space. It's called POPs, right? Uh, is this green space. So they say, okay, we do something that might be bad for the city, but in exchange, we compensate that by a, a giving to the public this nice uh, you know, open public space. So, but again, it, the drawing sounds good, good, interesting, could be interesting, but let's go there. Let's go to those uh, privately owned uh, public spaces and see how they work and see the reality. And what we've seen is that in most of the cases, uh, when they are created, they turn their backs to the surrounding city. So these are actual photographs taken uh, from the outside. So they kind of neglect uh, the outside. They are blank, uh, windowsless facades, super long, right? Um, very, very often, um, they have another um, character, which is like they are built on platforms. So they are separated from uh, from the ground. So you need to go up. Uh, there is certain control here. Uh, it's not easy to access, right? There is some barriers to access. Access When there is no barrier, they usually design things to stop people inside. For example, you can see the change of the pavement material here. This is the original pav pavement or the original uh, public space. And this is privately owned public space. And you can see the greenery has been put here in a strategic way to create a barrier so that people don't go in. And again, uh, you see this kind of uh, uh, fences and so on, which look like temporary, but this is a photograph that I, from a place that I go almost every day through, uh, you know, during the last three, four years. And every day I see this, it's not temporary, so it's permanent, right? So they are creating barriers so that people don't use the space. Um, when you have sometimes nice good spaces, but uh, they are usually kept empty only for very uh, programmed uh, and organized events. And one of the most surprising things like super basic activities in public space, like grabbing a onigiri and sitting in a bench and, and having your lunch is forbidden, right? Super basic. I mean, if, if there is something that I want to do in a public space, it's probably, probably that, you know, going to company, you know, having some obento, and then uh, if there is sun, you know, enjoying the sun, eating outside, that's forbidden, right? So is this really open? It is public space. I think um, instead of saying privately owned public space, we should at least say privately owned open space, but that would create a not so cool acronym. So uh, probably, uh, but I think it's, it's the proper uh, say to think that they are not public, but they are just open. So I think basically what we see now emerging are two models. One is the corporate led model uh, and the other is the, what I call the emergent Tokyo or the emergent uh, model. And the corporate model is, we could, you know, like encapsulate it with maybe in this image of huge towers with uh, shopping mall like spaces on the ground. And the emergent Tokyo is what I will be giving you like some glimpses because uh, well, um, you can get more information uh, with the book and I cannot cover the, the whole of the book, uh, just some snapshots. So first of all, why emergent? I think it's important concept. Um, during many decades, you have been, probably you have uh, heard that Tokyo is described as a city of chaos, right? Uh, almost like, uh, uh, it's almost like a stereotype, like saying that it's chaos. And I think Tokyo could be better be described as a city of order, but a different kind of order from the kind of order that we see in Barcelona or in Paris. And I think the concept of emergence is interesting. Uh, emergence means uh, the creation of order and functionality from the bottom up. That means that there is no leading brain or there is no master planning to organize uh, you know, elements or actors. But even though there is no such top-down management, they manage to create some kind of uh, order. And the classic example is the flocking behavior 
of animals, especially birds, is quite clear. So for example, you can see that birds create those amazing shapes when they fly, but this guy here is not the boss, right? He is not really the leader of, of, of this, of this uh, uh, flood. If the if they, if they change the direction, another bird will be uh, you know, on, the, on the tip of the arrow. So what happens is that the, each bird is just following single rules, just keeping the distance, keeping the speed, and in an emergent way, without the need of a, of a master planning, a certain order emerges. So I think it's a more interesting viewpoint uh, rather than chaos, which sounds like a little bit like disorder or, or lack of, of order, to think of Tokyo as a kind of emergent assemblage in which people, buildings, legislation, culture, etc., they all interact in such a way that at the end, there are like uh, spaces and districts which are definitely livable, uh, vibrant, and uh, very inclusive also from my viewpoint. So just some snapshots. Uh, when we talk about, or when I talk about emerging Tokyo, what kind of spaces am, am I talking about? For example, uh, Yokocho alleyways, right? Maybe you know Golden Guy in Shinjuku. Uh, this is an image uh, uh, taken from, uh, uh, from the top. And uh, uh, maybe this encapsulates you know, the, the character of uh, not only Yokocho, but also the low rise uh, uh, Tokyo in which you have like lots of very small buildings, and very tiny streets but this is really on asteroids. Uh, so you can see uh, the density, just to give an example, there is a number. There are like 250 bars, small micro bars, in a half of a size of a soccer field. So imagine the density. I think this is the densest area of bar micro bars in the world. And the streets are really tiny. So sometimes you can really touch uh, both uh, sides. Uh, and interestingly, they are, you know, they, they are old buildings and they, they, they don't look so, you know, so maybe cool, but in fact, they are uh, pretty popular even among tourists. And in the book, uh, we try to analyze them and to kind of almost like, a, like an anatomical research, just cutting through, you know, the flesh of all those buildings and see what's, what are the organs inside. And uh, you can see here, for example, that those bars are really tiny. Uh, they maybe can accommodate seven, eight uh, uh, people. And uh, you can see also that they can be managed by one single person, right? And, and they are immensely, you know, like very densely packed together. This is one example. You can see the dimensions inside, like maybe 2.4 meters of width, just, just that. But inside, each of them is customized, each of them expresses the character of the owner, because it can be managed by one single person, right? So each person doesn't need to follow, I don't know, like regulations or, or, or manuals by Starbucks or by, I don't know, any other chain. Um, they can be, you know, develop their own kind of business. Uh, I can give you more examples. Uh, this is another that I personally like a lot, is Yanagi Koji in Nishiogi Kubo on the HUO line. And it's not only by Japanese, for example, this is a bar that Chris, uh, a Greek chef is, is running in this area. And uh, I, it's my, one of my recommendations, if you go to, to there, uh, he's really nice. Uh, the bar is a 1.7 by 2.7 or a little bit more, uh, maybe like almost like three, three meters. So it's really tiny, uh, but still, uh, precisely because of that smallness, it's easy to manage by one person. And then if you go there, um, you know, now in Japan, uh, many people are saying that they lack opportunities to meet people, that they lack opportunities to communicate, they feel isolated, go there. I mean, there is no possibility that you're going to feel alone because you are so, you have to sit so close to the other that at least you have to say hello and conversations, you know, like uh, start naturally if you go to one of these uh, micro bars. More examples, uh, Dakyo buildings, uh, maybe you have heard this name, uh, are these uh, buildings where you have like different uses stuck on top of each other and covered by neon lights. Well, now it's not neon lights anymore. Now it's like LED, but still we can, you know, the neon covered buildings. Um, and basically they work as a kind of vertical uh, uh, yokocho. Uh, in the book, we analyze we kind of went through historical property records and tried to analyze uh, all the uses of, of many areas. And for example, uh, uh, we include this example 
in which we can see that these vertical buildings uh, haven't changed their um, uh, footprints over, uh, uh, you know, since the post-war, but they only have grown on the vertical dimension. And they, are, they have been very flexible in adapting to how the times change. So at the beginning, they were basically offices and retail and some restaurants, and now it's more about recreation and restaurants, et cetera. Et cetera. So they, they have, you have a, a kind of infrastructure that allows small businesses to be in a very central location and the building without changing it, uh, you, you can accommodate many different uh, uh, uses and uh, you can take advantage of the whole length of the building because as I will show here, well, this is part of the analysis, I'm going to focus on this plan. Uh, each, this shows a floor plan of the street. Each building is opening to the street. These red dots are elevators. These green uh, 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 rectangles are um, stairs. And you can see that the, the, the street is continuously aligned by stairs, elevators, entrances, blah, blah, blah. So they are like, it's a, an active street. So the building is not, the, these buildings are not turning their backs. These buildings are not creating blank facades. They are not windowsless, quite the opposite. They need all the vibrancy from the street to really to survive and therefore they are open into the street. But I think it's a more interesting model of how Tokyo could uh, grow upwards. Uh, more examples, uh, under track infields. This is a famous case of Ameyoko in Taito Ward, very close to Ueno. Uh, we could consider also as a kind of uh, 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 emergent market because uh, well, this is the structure or the railways crossing through Ueno. But once we go and we cut again uh, inside the building, this is like an, a kind of a section, we see that they have colonized the small spaces or gap spaces between the structure. And again, we have an accumulation of small businesses, a small, many of them, although there are chain stores also, but many of them uh, independent businesses. And interesting, the most interesting thing is that rather than creating barriers to the street, they are super permeable and porous. So it's a structure that allow people go through, allow them to move to, to move around. They invite people in in a very open way rather than exclude through several devices like platforms, uh, windows, left facades, et cetera. Uh, so this is the same. Uh, we really analyzed uh, all the uses and you can see the, the small scale uh, and the gran granularity, which is, by the way, uh, the same that is existing in the surroundings. One more example, Ankyo Streets. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to use public space is not because of certain cultural issues, but is quite uh, like recent legislation. And uh, uh, there are like some exceptions. So sometimes you will see like benches in some streets, lots of benches, or certain behaviors that uh, usually don't happen in certain streets. And in, according to our research, in many cases, those are Ankyo streets. Ankyo means covered river. They are, those are rivers which were covered. Basically, we are focusing, or, or most of our cases are those who were covered after the war, because some of them were covered before the war. And this case, for example, is Jiuaoka. It is this uh, Kuhun Butsugawa. Ryokudo is the Japanese name. So it's Kuhun Butsu River promenade. And you can see that there are lots of benches, right? This is very, there are like so many, in many maybe even too many benches. Um, and why is this so? This is so because legally, the central part of this street is not a street. If you define a street as a street, it, the police is, is it, it enters the uh, police jurisdiction and therefore becomes very difficult to, to use. But if it's a park or a promenade, then it's the municipal authorities and they can be more flexible. In this case, they allowed a seating, uh, putting benches on this uh, public land. And uh, the, the story is quite nice because nobody was really planning to put benches there, but uh, in a festival, they had a festival there and they had some trouble because people were uh, um, uh, parking bicycles and uh, well, they call it illegal parking, but it's for me calling parking bicycles like illegal sounds too much. I mean, like, come on, I mean, anyway, uh, illegal parking. They have an issue of illegal parking of bicycles. 
And uh, they didn't manage, they put like uh, all kind of billboards, please don't park here, blah, blah, but they didn't manage to, to, to really solve the issue. But then uh, in certain uh, festival, they, for the festival, they put some chairs outside and they realized that people were not parking their bicycles uh, close to the chair. So the people kind of naturally kind of avoided the chairs, right? Because, okay, people are polite here, right? In, in, so uh, what they discovered is that by putting chairs and benches, people, you know, stop parking there. And so they put almost like a, like a continuous uh, a, a row of benches. And I think it's a nice solution because, well, they, it solved an issue because they were like, really, it was, I saw it one too, too many bicycles. And at the same time, creates a, a, a nice promenade. So you can see like people, businesses, citizens, normal citizens testing things and allowing to be you know, flexible and not just being told by authorities how you have to use, you have to sit here, not here, but there are spaces that allow people to experiment a little bit. And uh, this is the last one, uh, dense low rise neighborhoods. Uh, well, this is a typical uh, image of Tokyo in which you will see like almost like an ocean of uh, small houses and all of a sudden, across by huge avenues along which you have like taller buildings and uh, well I don't know the first time as an architect that I came here as I was uh, just graduated when I saw this I thought that was like failed urbanism like come on guys I mean this is a kind of um, low rise typology needs a garden or something right it's too much packed together but I, I had to live in these kind of areas and uh, I started to discover that there quite nice and they are quite uh, uh, livable. This is a, a drawing, a diagram showing more or less how this works. So you can see like huge avenues, uh, very often uh, elevated uh, railways that cross in any kind of direction, not, not following the grid even of the city, cross through the city. And uh, you can see beyond the, the, these kind of uh, uh, high rises or medium rises, you can see another world, almost like a village, like of space of um, what I'm going to show here, of uh, 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 tiny alleyways, um, uh, uh, people, you know, living pots and greenery outside, uh, people or streets in which cars and bicycles and pedestrians, like, like kind of, share the space without any particular problem. And, uh, you know, also the typical guy or shopping promenade. And well, the book includes the history, historical process of all these examples that I'm mentioning. But uh, in this case, I think it's interesting to uh, emphasize that these areas, uh, maybe a little bit hundred years ago, were a bamboo forest, right? And now are uh, these kind of spaces in a process which uh, has not been really planned completely. Of course, the train lines and the big avenues have been planned, but much of the rest, I would say, is part of a, a micro negotiations there uh, between families that develop some micro developers, et cetera, local authorities. It's not really like the kind of top-down planning that we are used to see in most uh, Western cities. So, uh, well, uh, the book includes like more analysis, but I think it's, we, I can jump this slide and just mention that uh, if we plot all these five um, emergent patterns that I have mentioned, we can see that they are not like exceptions, you know, like uh, weird exceptions are uh, in several uh, strange, strange places, but they are all across the 23 wards of Tokyo and probably beyond. So they are important parts of Tokyo. They are neglected. For example, I don't know many people who have been studying Zakyo buildings, for example, but they are conspicuous. They are everywhere. And I think they actually actually uh, contribute to you know, make this city uh, more livable. So just to summarize, uh, how does Tokyo work? I think uh, at least we have to say, differentiate two types of Tokyo, at least. One is with a like corporate-led uh, urbanism or corporate Tokyo, which and the other is emergent urbanism. A corporate-led Tokyo, I think, works through economies of scale. It needs size becoming bigger and bigger. Every redevelopment, redevelopment needs to be bigger than the, the previous one. A very often, it's dominated by one single large corporation. Most of the times are big developers. A, the scale is about bigness, about global capital. Their boundaries, as, as I explained, is close boundaries. They are hierarchical 
in their configuration very often with very central spaces and subspaces. So it works more like, it's more like a hierarchy rather than a network. And they work through a several process of distraction. We are now in the second round. Many of the uh, areas that are now redeveloped were also redeveloped before the war, sorry, after the war, and uh, through a top-down management. So a process continuous process of distraction, uh, renovation, redevelopment, and top-down uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, approach. While uh, I think interesting part of Tokyo is that part that works according to economic agglomeration. So it means economies that are efficient and beneficial or benefit uh, the business in one single location is because they share connections, information, et cetera. Uh, multiplicity of agents, smallness, something that you can manage by yourself in the case of Yokocho, but also by the local community. The boundaries are porous, are permeable the boundaries of buildings, the boundaries of the, the configuration of the streets also. Uh, they are work rather than like a, a la network. There is no central, right? There is no central square. It's more like a network configuration. And they don't consist of a destruction of the existing city, but almost like an evolution, like we saw in the uh, Zakio buildings in which like where they were growing, but keeping uh, certain elements, in this case, the, the, the footprint, uh, and uh, in a process of incremental growth. So um, this, I think you have, I have to summarize, are some of the principles, how, how Tokyo works, and especially the emergent urbanism, which I think is the most interesting part. And uh, well, many, uh, many of you or some of you will think, okay, that is very nice. Uh, that's very cool. Yeah, I also like macro bars, <laughs> blah, blah. But um, so what can we do? I mean, um, by the end, what you are saying is that this is, spontaneous urbanism, you mentioned that. So we should maybe just wait and, and sit and, and see how the city evolves because it's a spontaneous. And um, well, my reply would be not really because if we, do don't, we, we don't do anything, this corporate urbanism is probably going to grow, grow and more. And uh, spontaneous doesn't mean passive, right? So the reason why these principles managed to work well in Tokyo is because there were associations, there were people behind. I mean, the Yokocho have associations that in many cases have fought against redevelopment. There are like networks of people, informal sometimes, very formal sometimes also. So there is a, an active involvement of people in their involvement. They are not architects, they are not developers, they are not policy makers. They are normal people, normal people like you and I, like living in Tokyo, who are active in their environment. So what can we do if we should be more active in order to be part of this kind of, uh, be an agent, one of the multiplicity of agents in this emergent assemblage that is emergent Tokyo? I think, well, I have maybe some, some things that I would like to you know, propose you maybe for the questions also, but first of all, pay attention to your environment, like be aware of what is changing. If you like a park, and this park is going to be redeveloped. Maybe, maybe you should you know, pay attention why, what is going on. Maybe start shopping more local because all the places that we like, nice restaurants and nice cafes tend to be rather like local businesses. Support urban activism. There are like lots of groups really fighting uh, for these kind of qualities. Create petitions, appeal to the media, participate in much is equity. Maybe you know this word, it's like town making is the literal translation, but it's kind of uh, volunteers who work in the city to improve the environment. Start by yourself, community projects. Maybe you can even uh, find uh, uh, like crowdfunding or, or, or try to find like uh, fund yourself. And why not ask politicians? And if you can also uh, vote. These are some of the things that, uh, you know, we, we can do all of us because we are all part of Tokyo. We all live in this city. And uh, Emergent Tokyo is asking us to be active in this period, uh, maybe more than uh, never, uh, more than ever before, precisely because uh, we are in a dangerous uh, uh, moment uh, in the development of Tokyo. And I think also uh, 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 we need to change a little bit from, let's say, the previous moment in which we were less aware of these issues. And now I think we need to be more active and really try to protect those parts of Tokyo that we really love and enjoy. And that's all. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Jorge. So like I said, we'll have time. We can open it up for questions and answers. Um, if you're on Zoom, I guess, what can you do? Just turn on your microphone and ask a question and that's fine. Um, if you are here in the room, people on Zoom can't hear you. So if you're in the room and you have a question, I'll come, we'll come over and I'll give you the microphone so that everybody can, can, uh, can hear what you're saying. I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, what brought you to Japan to be an architect and why become an architect? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's taking the sound from here is okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody can hear you now. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I um, it's two separate things. I, I, I was an architect before coming to Japan. But I was very interested in, in Japanese architecture. Yeah, I think Japanese is a um, leading country in terms of architectural design. Uh, we have very close by like Ikutake's uh, building, you know, the Edo Tokyo Museum, um, uh, for example. So it's, it's, it's full of interesting pieces of architecture. And uh, of course, you have also the traditional architecture. Uh, but I was also interested, uh, very intrigued by Tokyo, I must say, because it uh, kind of challenges when you come, especially when you come from Europe, um, it challenges uh, many principles. So it's the first impression is really like Tokyo is chaos, right? And so, but still it's everyone is living here and everything is so well organized and, and you start work and it's really nice place, right? So what is going on here? I mean, maybe my principles were not absolute truths, maybe. So then it started to, you know, becoming more, more uh, uh, interested. But uh, yeah, I, I was an architect before, basically, I don't know, like most architects or uh, kids that studied architecture. They kind of like uh, art, but they also like science. And uh, at the end, they, they, architecture is a kind of a good compromise. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, my, my fascination for Tokyo started um, after I became an architect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman in the corner. Yeah, I'm uh, fascinated by all the cool diagrams and everything. How did you get the uh, information to make those cross sections? Because it's so exact detail. Yeah. I like that golden guy, for example. Yes. Um, you can get very rough, very rough uh, information uh, through, um, you know, the, the, the normal information. I mean, you can get the footprint shape basically only from, from the data, right? From the data offered by the Tokyo government. So it's a field work. It's people going there measuring. First of all, you have to, uh, you, have to you know, become friends with the, with the guy, right? Running the bar, right? So it involves a little bit of drinking together. Um, so you cannot do conduct field work very often. Uh, it's not good for your health. Um, but after you know going there and and then you explain that you like those places, that you're not a developer who's measuring for other purposes, right? Uh, and you love them and you really want to 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 you know like um, you know defend them or show their their uh, more po most positive part because there are also problems, of course. Uh, and then, yes, slowly uh, you get permission or you don't. I mean, I must say that the, the places that we chose here are um, some of the places where, you know, people were more open, uh, but some other places were most, more difficult. Yeah? So it's a lot of field work, uh, going there, measuring. Yeah, it's like many hours of field work, I would say. Yeah, of course, I, I'm not alone here. Uh, the book includes a list of all the students and contributors that works, so it's a collective project, yeah. And uh, the book is in the Lakeland Library, by the way, for Lakeland students. Yeah. It's, it's there, so check it out. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, 
I didn't hear you mention the historical dimension mm -hmm. very much, although yes. you sort of, I think, uh, broached it in talking about places like Golden Guy. Yeah. But I, I wonder, I mean, it strikes me that Tokyo is a very unhistorical setting for architecture, or rather there's very little historical architecture yes. evident, um, particularly in comparison to, say, European cities yeah. or I think even American cities. Yeah. Um, and I, I realize that probably has something to do with the materials and the, the 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 cycle that they use here. But I wonder what role do you think that a historical preservation element could play in sort of uh, motivating the uh, emergent side that you mentioned, making it more attractive. You know, that's the problem I think with some of the older areas, which you noted have a great sort of a you know a vitality but they then tend to lack a kind of a let's say aesthetic charm yeah which would be i think could be increased by having some historical element added to it what do you yeah. think about that well th this question is goes really to the core of the problem really it's, it's the most important question probably uh, well um of course uh, tokyo was destroyed twice in this uh, last century um so, it, I mean, um, most of Tokyo, not all of Tokyo. And, uh, and therefore, uh, there is a lack of historical buildings. I don't think that there are many buildings that are more than 100 years ago. And those that seems to be like more than 100 years ago, they have been so renovated that at the end, there is no material, physical material that is left from that period, old period. Um, so that is one issue. Uh, another issue is that, um, <coughs> You know, because of um, anti-earthquake uh, and other safety regulations, buildings need to be updated continuously. Uh, that's another problem. Uh, I would say also that there is a tradition of building light, uh, which is being continued now. I mean, most of Tokyo, 70% of Tokyo is made of wood. There's something that people don't know, like balloon frame kind of system. So it's, it's quite light. Tokyo is city of wood, made of wood. Uh, so all these parameters uh, at the end uh, create a, a kind of a, a culture of scrap and build. This is how they, they call it, right? It's continually changing. So in this process, uh, preservation becomes very difficult. Um, so what to do? I mean, many of the projects that I show, I mean, not the project, but many of the cases that I show, for example, the Yokochos, they are the same structure as the, the, the first structure. So they preserve uh, a lot of the, the materials. And of course, uh, that's one important issue. So we want, we want uh, Yokocho. I mean, we like Yokocho. And I haven't even heard that some rumors that there is even some people who are trying to consider enlisting it as a kind of, in this case, golden guy, as a kind of world heritage site, right? But it, it is kind of, it's very challenging because it goes against the concept that we have in the West of preservation, because we think of preservation of preserving the materiality of buildings, while the materiality is really poor and is continuously changing because they change their own, uh, they do their own uh, pre uh, renovations inside. And uh, so how, I think we need, this is a challenge not only for, for Tokyo, I think many Asian countries, we need to develop a model of preservation that goes beyond the preservation of uh, the material aspect of the building. So, for example, how about preserving lifestyles? For example, like how people live or communities. Um, this is also a kind of preservation, right? So I would argue that uh, if you change, if you redevelop Golden Guy and make a huge tower, even if you include a kind of, uh, Yokocho like space, like uh, Toranomon Yokocho, or maybe are you happy there? Um, this is not reproducing the lifestyle. So it's, it's the building, I mean, the physicality is, disappears, but also the lifestyle. So I think it's, it's quite uh, challenging. I'm completely um, in favor of renovating, and my own practice I've been renovating. I think there are like many possibilities to retrofit all buildings. Uh, but we must acknowledge that um, given the circumstances, it's very difficult in many cases. So I think we need to change our concept of what is preservation in this kind of East Asian context of 
you know, like, uh, let's say, very light building and uh, many safety issues and think of uh, in a different way, you know, preservation in a different way. I don't know if I'm answering to your, to your question, but uh, it's, it's a very important challenge, yeah. Um, I believe the best thing that Tokyo can achieve probably is layering of, of historical layers, right? So I believe like Zakyo building, for example, they keep the, the, the footprint. Uh, sometimes uh, we can also go back even to Edo period when certain uh, sites were assigned to certain samurai and there's, that's why they had like this specific width or whatever. So there are like historical reasons behind uh, dimensions and so on. Um, but probably keeping all the, the historical heritage is, is, or most of the historical heritage can be quite problematic, I think. In the book, I, I, I didn't have time to talk about that, but the book includes a, a, probably from, even from Meiji period, a snapshots of the developments in each period. So you can see for each pattern in each case, there are like history and you can see the history and um, most of the cases that we have shown today are cases in which layers of history are you know, stuck on top of each other and they create a very rich environment, uh, but not just freezing the, the, the building or freezing the history. It's not like uh, in Europe, we would say like museumizing or creating the, transforming the city as an open air museum, right? Like sometimes in our cities, they become like really like open air museums because we keep all the buildings and everything, but the vibrancy, the people are outside. At the end, you only have shops inside, you know, nobody's living there. So that's another issue, right? Um, okay, thank okay. you. So I, I apologize, I laughed when you mentioned Golden Guy as possibly a World Heritage Site. Yeah. Because our um, Lakeland's campus until last year was very close to Golden Guy. Uh huh. And um, I don't know, walking past there on a Friday night, I saw things that were not befitting of a world heritage. I see, yeah. I see. So, okay, okay. <laughs> um, maybe we can wrap this up. I, I just have one, one last quick question. If you can uh, look, let's say, 20 years into the future, what would you envision? What's yeah. going to happen to Tokyo, and not, and I don't mean in a, you know, not what what you would wish to happen, but yeah. what you think is going to happen. There, there, those, I don't those, know if uh, there is a chat, uh, someone who wants to intervene. I don't know if you, we should, uh, to make it a little bit more interactive. Is, is, that may, that is, may there, is there a question in the chat? Someone raise his hand, like Joshua. Are you are you able to are you able to hear me? Yeah. Oh, hold on a second, Josh. Sorry. That's my fault. I apologize. I, I, I didn't uh, recognize the emoji that you were using. <laughs> Can you say hello, Josh? Yes. Hello. There we go. Um, so if you can hear me um, briefly, I just have a question. Um, so I, I was actually very interested when you mentioned uh, the lack of public spaces in Tokyo. And uh, and particularly when you brought up the uh, that snapshot from Yokohama, I would have assumed that that enormous space was considered a public space, but to my surprise, it's not. Though to my question, it's more toward parks. I would like to know how much planning goes into the inclusion of parks in Tokyo and why they are not in turn considered public spaces as well? Pops. Parks. Parks or pops? Cohen, parks. Cohen. Okay, well, uh, parks are, of course, um, Japanese planning includes plants, uh, includes parks. So you, you have to, in each uh, area, there needs to be as for, of course, this is not always possible, but they need to, to, have, to have parks. So there are uh, parks uh, or uh, planning includes uh, parks. And there are in fact, many nice parks, which were many of them planned before the war. Um, but, uh, and these I think are still one of the most uh, public in uh, situations, I think parks. Uh, which we can really say they are still truly 
public. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't been there for a long time, but uh, I think in, in Yoyogi Coin, Yoyogi Park, for example, it's amazing the activities that you could see on Sunday, like uh, people mm -hmm. have, doing picnic or, or uh, you know, like um, practicing uh, any kind of sports. But regarding parks, I think there is a problem now, uh, which is like they are being targeted for redevelopment also, parks. The most, exam the most famous example is uh, Miyashita Park in Shibuya. It was transformed into a four-story shopping mall and a hotel, you might know that. And now there is another park, which is Jingu Gaian. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 this kind of area, of sports area that includes like Pebble Stadium and so on. Uh, that also is, uh, is now targeted for redevelopment. And it seems that they are going to cut 1,000 trees in order to uh, put uh, some huge buildings also there. So now the next stage for many developers is to you know, go for parks. Uh, why? Because they're in very good locations and they are open, right? You don't need to negotiate with uh, hundreds of owners. And uh, this is very important now that we kind of fight uh, also against that because uh, parks are necessary for, for our, you know, like livability, I think are essential. And the pandemic showed that is very important. So yeah, parks are now are the most, probably the most uh, public space in Tokyo, but they are now, uh, uh, I would say. I see, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. And the question, the well, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's, um, that's a very difficult question. I hope it's not a depressing way to end the talk. No, I would say, well, uh, but uh, to be, I mean, now uh, Tokyo is starting and not only, even Tokyo, uh, some uh, wards and some areas in Tokyo are becoming depopulated. This is something that we were seeing in the countryside, in rural areas, but now certain areas of Tokyo, we can you can see the, the see the demographics are becoming to see uh, become depopulating. Population is aging. Uh, we don't see any change. I don't have I haven't seen any change in last twenty years of any attitude towards immigration. Mm, well, a little bit maybe from the back from the back door, you know, like interns and or, or students, but actually kind of working like immigrants, but not kind of change official in the official kind of uh, 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 attitude, I would say um, Japan will not solve this problem in 20 years through uh, immigration, like for example, Spain did. Spain uh, was very open to immigrants and, and all of a sudden like many of them came and thanks to that, you know, the country more or less managed to, to survive uh, during a, a long period. Uh, I mean, survive, I mean, like economically improve its situation. Uh, but I don't see that happening in, uh, in Japan. So um, I probably think that um, many of the um, um, uh, projects and uh, many of the initiatives that we are seeing in the countryside, uh, like for example, creating community spaces, or uh, renovating houses, or uh, kind of uh, creating uh, shared homes. And many of the interesting, innovative, social kind of initiatives that we are seeing in the countryside, probably we will see, start seeing them in Tokyo, I guess. So I think I, have a, I see a bright feature in the sense that we are being going to force to be more aware of each other. Uh, because uh, we are being, to, I mean, the population is going to be older and we will need to help each other. And, um, you know, young people are going to be very scarce. <laughs> um, and I think uh, probably we are going to develop more or Tokyo is going to develop more uh, in that direction. I think there is a post growth period coming, uh, at least in terms of population. And uh, I think this kind of project, I think the kind of Tokyo that I am uh, highlighting is going to become more important. Uh, of course, huge redevelopments will continue, but I think it's not going to continue forever. Um, at certain point, I think we will see a little bit like the wave going down. That's what I think. I Let's meet again in 20 years and see. You're, you're <laughs> in 2042, we'll do it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Well, everybody, why don't we give a very, very nice round of applause to Professor Almazani. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, while you're here, let me tell you that on uh, November 10th, we are going to be joined by uh, Carl Gabrielson, who will talk about, I'll hold it up here, Okinawans and US military bases, right? I think a pretty good topic for LUJ, given uh, our status as an American university here in Tokyo. Um, Mr. Gabrielson is, uh, he's an expert who's been researching this for a long time, and he's actually here right now. He's up in the third balcony. I don't know if you guys can see him. <laughs> Fellas, put the spotlight on him, would you? Yeah, he's way up there. Um, so that's going to be November 10th. If you're on Zoom and you're not on our mailing list already, you can just reply to the email that you got for the, uh, for the Zoom link today, and I can send you the information. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. Thank you. Gracias. Nada.